screen sharing. Hello, everyone. Today we will be reading the um, the the Young Lords: A Radical History. We'll be reading. We'll start reading pages um, two seventeen for today. Previously, the other chapters that we were reading before, we were on Friday. They were talking about um, about um, about if I remember correctly, building solidarity within their communities and um, and about um, and about revolutionary uh, nationalism, if I remember correctly. But as always, we'll begin starting with the statement of of unity. Which I'll be reading right now. All right, screen share. All right, hopefully, y'all can see this. Can everyone see this? Yes, comrade. Right on. Yes. So I'll start with so I'll start with reading the statement of unity preface. <clears throat> The U.S. was founded as a colonial settler state based upon white supremacy and slavery, stealing the lands of the indigenous nations, breaking every treaty made with them, and confining them to quote-unquote reservations, concentration camps. As the country became more powerful, the ego sunk, the, sunk its claws into other, into other nations, making war on Mexico and grabbing its northern territory, even in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines, and either annexing them outright or making them colonies or neo-colonies. And, in the 20th century, it became the major imperialist power of the world, bullying, uh, exploiting both the people within its boundaries and those in every other country, bullying them with military intervention, and robbing them of their right to self-determination. As Hugh P. Newton stated, quote, We have two enemies to fight, racism and capitalism. Between the two, capitalism is primary. Racism is a byproduct of capitalism. The working people of the working people of the world, of every ethnicity or nationality, face a common enemy that's destroying life on Earth. Our enemy is a small ruling class of property owners controlling most of the world's wealth and resources. We must have our basic needs met to live a good and meaningful life. Food, shelter, healthcare, education, freedom from the oppression of the state and peace with other nations. To obtain these, es these essential things for life, we, have, we, have, we must have the power to see to it that the abundance that is available is shared equitably. Statement of Unity for the Second Rainbow Coalition. The legacy of the First Rainbow Coalition dates back to its founding on April 4th, 20, 19, <laughs> 1969, by the original Black Panther Party, original Young Lords, and Young Patriots Organization. A number of other organizations joined this coalition not too long afterwards, such as the American Indian Movement, Brown Berets, Rising Up Angry, the Red Guards, and others. Since the founding of the United States, the masses have had developed a number of popular movements that came together to fight back against this capitalist and peerless system in various ways around particular demands. Nevertheless, none had established a movement quite like the First Rainbow Coalition. This historic movement was the first of its kind that established a model of class struggle like no other. Its charismatic leader, Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois chapter of the original Black Panther Party, stated that at the end of the day, we weren't engaged in a quote-unquote race struggle. He said that the class struggle, goddammit. By uniting with the various oppressed ethnicities and nationalities uh, and masses, they were able to bridge the gap between the various ethnic communities that white supremacy had long sought to keep divided. This class solidarity equipped them with a material basis and class consciousness to see their common class condition, therefore the necessity to form a united front against their common class oppressor, the capitalist imperialist ruling class. The ruling class viewed this as the greatest threat to their class rule, and subsequently used the entire oppressive forces of the state, police, courts, jails, prisons, and intelligence agencies, etc., in order to crush this emerging revolutionary socialist movement. We refounded the Rainbow Coalition on May 14th, 2021, with the intent of upholding the, le the legacy of the original Rainbow Coalition. We believe that this historic example is the model for the United Front that will best serve our class liberation. 
by upholding the templating program of the original Black Panther Party, which was subsequently adopted and later expanded by the original Young Lords, Young Patriots Organization, and all other original Rainbow Coalition members, uh, we establish our pragmatic unity. The six disciplinary rules to, um, rules that we uphold ties all organizations in our coalition to a common professional discipline. History has been upon our generation a common class mission to fulfill. The representatives of the capitalist imperialist ruling class, represented by the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, cannot liberate us. It is their class intention and class interest to uphold our common class oppression. Therefore, it is only we, the oppressed masses of all ethnicities and nationalities, who must build the necessary class solidarity, class consciousness, organizational structures, and a united front that will ultimately, li ultimately liberate ourselves. This is what the Second Rainbow Coalition is committed to. This is the historic mission we intend to fulfill. Dare to struggle, dare to win. All members of the coalition, New African Black Panther Party, White Panther Party, Green Party of New Jersey, Poor People's Army, La Mesa Nacional de Brown Braze, Nassau, North Alabama School for Organizers, New Era Young Lords, um, and American Indian Movement, Northeast Woodland Chapter. The six disciplinary rules. Number one, members will conduct themselves in a manner to bring credit to the coalition and will treat others with respect and politeness. Number two, Members will be sober when on Rainbow Coalition business and will not engage in any criminal activity while a member. Number three, no member will engage in violence except in the extremity of self-defense. Number four, no member, um, members will not gossip nor be divisive to the unity of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Number five, members will not act as informers nor work against the purpose of the Second Rainbow Coalition. And number six, Nobody is authorized to speak for the Second Rainbow Coalition or is authorized to do so. And that is the same of beauty. All right. Um, Shanti May, if you can, um, could you... Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, could you screen share? Yeah. Uh, what page are we on this time? We're on, we are on page... Um, 217, post-war conditions give rise to nationalism. Post-war. Okay. And we'll be reading from pages, let me see. We'll be reading from pages 217 to pages, let me see, let me see, from pages 217 to pages um, 227. So, yeah. Thank you. Oh, 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 oh I, I was going to ask if you wanted to read first. <laughs> Oh, um, I mean, I can do up to uh, practicing a particular kind of class politics so that we can, you know, discuss. Gotcha. Okay. Post-war conditions give rise to nationalism. In the 1960s, nationalist sentiment grew among activists of color many of whom came to view the building of separate race-based organizations as the most effective vehicle for social change. The persistence of racism in the culture and institutions of US society, even in spite of the passage of civil rights legislation, fueled this perspective as did the feeling that their white counterparts in the new left couldn't overcome their paternalism towards people of color. Of his decision to leave SDS, Juan Gonzalez explains that during his time in prison, he engaged in concentrated study of national, colonial, and racial issues. And while SDS was, quote, increasingly talking much more about self-determination and national liberation, they were doing it in a very paternalistic and controlling way. So I realized that I couldn't stay in that organization, that I had to go to my own community. Iris Morales, has similar feelings about the paternalism of white activists, 
The same sentiment had been articulated in the mid 1960s by Black Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or SNCC workers who grew weary of both interracial dating and white paternalism among white civil rights workers. The SNCC's experiment in multiracial civil rights organizing in the early 1960s, while successful in many ways, set the stage for its repudi repudiation of multiracial organizing later in the decade. Separate sentiments also increased as a result of the post-war demographic transformation of Northern cities. As workers of color migrated there in large numbers, working and middle-class white residents moved to racially exclusive suburbs. Propelled by a vast post-war project of home ownership engineered by real estate developers and secured with federally funded mortgages for whites only. By the 1960s, the live experience of white Americans and people of color who remained in isolated, poor, and over-policed urban neighborhoods grew further and further apart. The tax-based erosion in the cities that accompanied white flight and the growing crisis of deindustrialization exacerbated this difference. The segregation of the country's housing landscape had its social consequences. Quote, the gulf of incomprehension separating even liberal rights from the real lives of Black people and other racialized groups. In this context, the material basis for interracial unity between people of color and white Americans appeared to be evaporating. And the 1930s communist slogan, quote, Black and white unite and fight, seemed harder and harder to enact. In addition, as we have seen, the experience in New York of white resistance to basic civil rights demands for racial equality in education and an independent civilian complaint review board of the police overwhelmed efforts by white liberal organizations such as Equal, which opposed school segregation in New York. Because most 1960s activism centered around community and not workplaces, where despite the persistence of racial labor segmentation, there was greater integration. A struggle based on interracial collaboration with white Americans was very difficult to imagine. However, as the post-war city became home to larger numbers of Mexican Americans, Native Americans, and people of Chinese, Filipino, Japanese, and Korean descent across the country, the call for black and white to unite and fight was replaced with calls for solidarity amongst people with long-standing histories of racial oppression and ethnic-based resistance to that condition. Efforts at coalition building after 1968 were regional in scope, but resonated nationally among activists like the Young Lords who reported about these various struggles and sent solidarity greetings. In New York's Chinatown, Asian Americans were replicated the politics, organizational framework, and activities of the Young Lords and the Black Panthers in Iwo Quinn. The radical wings of the movement in Los Angeles included Chicanos, the Brown Berets, and later the Center for Autonomous Workers, which organized Mexican workers. Among Japanese Americans and other Asian constituencies was the East Wind, which developed service programs similar to those of the Black Panthers. Meanwhile, in the San Francisco Bay Area, Black American, Native American, Chicano, and Asian students organized strikes calling for ethnic studies at Berkeley and at San Francisco State University and coalesced there in the Third World Liberation Front. Meanwhile, Chinese Americans in the Red Guard armed themselves and set up community organizing programs in San Francisco's Chinatown, developing ties with the Black Panthers and various radical Chicano groups. And while Native Americans have been engaged in disparate actions claiming rural lands, the occupation of Alcatraz Island in San Francisco by a group that called itself the Indians of All Tribes Coalition grew support from third world activists nationally. It also set in motion dozens of occupations of federal properties by Native Americans, including the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C., and the national expansion of the American Indian Movement following the occupation of the Pine Ridge Reservation or concentration camp as radical alternatives to the strategies of longstanding moderate Native American leaders and groups. Of necessity, 
Young Lords organizing was anchored in the fight against Puerto Rican oppression and poverty in the urban centers of the mainland. But because Black Americans and Puerto Ricans lived side by side in East Harlem, the Young Lords socioeconomic campaigns attracted their Black American neighbors. The Young Lords welcomed them. Over 25% of the Young Lords members were Black Americans. It seemed appropriate that the radicalized children of first generation Puerto Rican migrants would identify with the DPP, even as their migrant parents were hesitant about that identification. Another 5% of the members were non-Puerto Rican Latinos. The logic of revolutionary nationalism was premised on the notion of shared interests among uh, oppressed people. As Panama Alba explained about his own experience at Lincoln Park with the Young Lord, at Lincoln Hospital with the Young Lords in the 1960s, his Panamanian origins did not pose a contradiction to his affiliation with the Puerto Rican organization. Quote, this was the age of Jack Rivera, an Argentine doctor who fought and led the Cuban revolution. It was, it was a time of international solidarity among oppressed people. The Young Lords' diverse membership captured a defining political sentiment among large numbers of urban radicals, solidarity among people of color. Along with others of their generation, the Young Lords advanced a new kind of revolutionary multiracial politics in the United States, that of a third world left, which made common cause not only with other revolutionary nationalist parties, but also with white radicals. Right on. Thank you so much, Shanti. That was awesome. All right. Practicing a particular kind of class politics. The Young Lord's critique of capitalism, like that of the Black Panthers, developed in response to the conditions of urban poverty in which many of their members were reared. The articulated they articulated the grievances of Puerto Ricans on the mainland with, with eloquence and grace, in part because they, they emerged originally, organically, from the Puerto Rican settlements of the 1950s and were attuned to their community's aspirations. Running as central themes throughout the Young Lord's 13-point program and platform are issues of social and economic wants and the question of control over the major institutions that shape society. The group denounced, quote, the violence of hunger, the group denounced, quote, the violence of hungry children, illiterate adults, diseased old people, and the violence of poverty and profit, unquote. Although early protests led by the NAACP um, and the Congress on Racial Equality in the North had focus on race and class, such as housing discrimination and exclusion from, uh, from the labor unions in construction, in construction and other industries, with the emergence of the Black Panthers and later the Young Lords, in response to oppression sharply or oriented around issues of class of of class achieved or organizational form and expression Dur during the first two years of its existence the young lords organization ylo identified karl marx's lumpen proletariat the group of, of permanently unemployed unemployed and discouraged workers eking out a living on the, on the margins of society, largely, largely through criminal activity, as a social class with the greatest revolutionary potential. And that's what I'm saying. <laughs> that position was formally adopted at the organization's first um, retreat in May 1970. Like the Panthers, the Lords expanded that, that classical Marxist definition of the lump in it by including the poor on, in general in its ranks. People on the, on the state relief um and the, the partially unemployed <clears throat> yep um they argued that unlike the working class which tended to, which tended toward compliance with the rules of society the lumpen had no investment in capitalism and possessed a fierceness bravery and disregard for and disregard for authority that could be channeled toward revolutionary ends. Preach. Hence the group hence the group welcomed former gang members, drug users, and those repeatedly institutionalized by the state for petty crime. Pablo Guzman discuss, discussed 
the p the place of the sorry Pablo Guzman discussed the place of the destitute classes in, in the book Balante. Quote, the first segment of our people that will join, work with, and support the revolution is the lumpen, the street people, prostitutes, junkies, two-bit pushers, hustlers, welfare mothers. That's the group that got the, pa- the party through its first two years. That, that The street people come into the revolution because they've got nothing to lose. And it's a law of revolution that the most oppressed group takes the leadership, the leadership position. Not the Black Panthers, known as the Black Panthers' lumpen thesis, and advanced especially by by Eldridge Cleaver, the position that rom- um, romanticized the most oppressed sectors of society at those at, as those most likely to resist. The irony, however, was that the leaders of both organizations were not "quote unquote" the street people, but were among the most educated um, young 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 working class Puerto Ricans and Black Americans of their generation. The theory is co- is contradicted by histories and assessments of social movements and revolutions across time and place, which suggest that grassroots leadership and mass social transformation are fueled by the higher expectations that come with improved conditions, organizational resources, and intellectual capital um, rather than the isolation and despair of extreme oppressive conditions. Former leaders estimate that despite the organization's um, lump in orientation, only a very few number of its members, approximately 10%, were drawn from this class. Most young lords in New York were former college students, high school dropouts, and people who were employed part-time. Approximately 5% were Vietnam veterans, and a small percentage worked full-time. In line with the in line with their lump and orientation, the young lords like the Black Panthers focused on the crisis of drug addiction in poor communities of color, which they um, which they accurately described as a growing epidemic. In the end, the group's uh, political analysis of the problem was more compelling than its pr- proposal for for redress, which which consumed it a, a disproportionate part of its limited organizational resources. The Bronx, for example, um, where the young lord opened an office in spring 1970, had the highest rate of heroin addiction in the world. The, the very first um, edition of Palante discussed the problem in an article titled um, Gorilla on, on Your Back, quote unquote, a 1960s reference to heroin. The article um, posited that heroin was was consciously used by those in power to quote unquote pacify oppressed people and turn them on each other when oppressed people might otherwise be turning their collective power against quote politicians, greedy businessmen, and racist um, murdering pig cops unquote. Yep. What the young right. lords report? That's what they do. That, that um that's what they do. The um the um this this white supremacist cellular colonial system has been doing this since since the early days of westward expansion when they got indigenous americans um addicted to alcohol to make them fight amongst th- themselves and said and sell the sellers and if you wonder where the uh the root causes of our drug problem and alcoholism come from that's your the answer. state yep the state um where was I again? All right. Oh, yeah. What? Well, thank you. <laughs> While the young lords reporting might have appeared um, um, conspiration, conspiratorial. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you. Conspiratorial. Their analysis re- reflected ideals long adopted by the Black Power movements and the broader left, according to Michael. Um, Rosman, a radical um, sociologist at the University of California, Berkeley, quote, The effect of all th- this injection of heroin is that the ghetto people's energies um, become... Sorry, what? Um, the effect of this injection of heroin that um, is that the ghetto people's energies become absorbed internally, turned against itself, undermining all revolutionary impulses against the external colonizing forces and the social conditions they have created, unquote. In addition, by the, by the mid-1970s, con- um, congressional, um, congressional 
investigations had exposed the complacency and involvement of the of individuals in the CIA and some high-ranking U.S. military officials in the heroin trade in Laos, where poppy flowers from which heroin is derived were were plentiful. Eventually, the young lords adopted the the formulation coined by new by by New York Black Panther Michael Tauber. Capitalism plus dope equals genocide. Yep, literally. Yeah, yep. they saw, they saw the, um, that right there. Capitalism plus dope equals genocide. That's literally what the whole um, war on drugs was. That's, it was genocide. A, that was essentially the, that was essentially the thing. As a matter of fact, when we're done reading, I will get the link to where you can read that um, capitalism plus dope equal, equals genocide from Michael Tabor, who. Um, in case y'all don't know, is part of the Panther 21. Um, when uh, 21 people of the New York uh, chapter of the Black Panthers were um, arrested for uh, quote unquote conspiracies to, you know, you know, kill, you know, officers and blood buildings and, you know, stuff like that. But yeah, um, when, when we're done reading, I will put in the audio where, of, of Michael himself um, talking from um, capitalism plus dope equals genocide because that's essentially that essentially answers your question of yep, where all and oh sorry no 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 that's essentially the answer of where it all came from yep and what some people <laughs> don't know yeah oh sorry and what some and people I... don't know is that um is that no knock warrants originated from the the war on drugs that's where that's where they originated that's exactly where they originated and I had no idea that heroin once again came from a plant, just like the co just like cocaine came from the coca plant. But a lot of people don't know that. They don't want you to know because they use these um, plants into laboratory uh, weapons of class warfare against colonized people, against oppressed people. This is essentially your answer right here. Mm -hmm. No idea about the poppy flowers. I had no idea, but once again, that's your answer. Right on. Um, they saw the drug crisis in poor urban communities of color as part of a global web. One that linked the one that linked the proliferation of drug use and black market drug trafficking by officers in the Vietnam War to the funneling of drugs to urban centers in, in the United States. The vehicle of community protests around, around which radicals focused their activities inevitably put them in frequent contact with, with, with criminal, unstable, and undisciplined elements within the lumpen proletariat. Um, as Dennis Oliver reported on the Young Lords radio program on WBAI, quote, we are also dealing with drugs. It is obvious that our people of El Barrio do not bring in the reported 300 tons of illegal drugs that entered Amer America that year. The man, the, the man himself is directly responsible for, for keeping us high. Since junkies are victims and not the cause of the problem, we are starting to we're, we're starting a, a guerrilla drug clinic. This means getting an apartment, cleaning it up, screening junkies for commitment, and then having them kick cold turkey. To date, we have brought about half a dozen brothers and sisters back home. A new man and a new woman are emerging, and their child is revolution. <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, in line with, with its orientation of, quote, serving the people, unquote, the Young Lords provided drug rehabilitation that included discussion on the impact of race and class inequality on personal psych psycholog um, psychology as a tool of personal um, re re regeneration. After establishing a person's fr frankness and determination to, quote, unquote, kick the habit, their program paired the person with two young lords who kept watch over their drug, uh, over over their drug user through the difficult process of withdrawal over the course of twenty four hours, um, isolation. One young lord was then assigned as mentor and twenty four hour buddy for a six month period. The um the mentor was responsible for combating um political education with moral support to help the user stay away from. Temptation. In the face of an epidemic, the project was at best a symbolic gesture of humanistic love and support for, for the downtrodden. 
Commit to reforming and politicizing those involved in petty crime and gangs. The organization was attuned to the pulse of street life. As morally upright revolutionaries, the young lords prided themselves in cleaning up the blocks where they were active by expelling dope dealers, whom they denounced as social predators poisoning the community. Some male members of the young lords describe um, engaging in street battles with the elements and stripping them of money which they argued had been taken from the most vulnerable people in the community. The group reported that that practice um, angered the mafia, which according to the YLO and its street contacts, put on a, co a contract of $20,000 for the murder of Felipe Luciano. God damn, $20,000. Jesus. It was fast. It didn't work. Yep, it did not fucking work. <laughs> sure. On the ground, on the ground, however, th these efforts exhausted the group's limited organizational resources, confused social service service with agitation and political um, strategy. The 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 mainstay and primary function of a grassroots political organization, and as experience has shown, weakened the group. As a class, the limited proletariat is easily manipulated politically. Untethered at, to the responsibilities of work and family, which act as a force of discipline and collective consciousness among workers, it tends to rely on hustling and often intimidation and violence as a means of survival. For these reasons, lumpen, lumpens were frequently used by the FBI as, eight, as agents pro, um, provocateurs to infiltrate, subvert, and undermine organizations such as the Young Lords and especially the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers' idealization of the Lumpen had been identified by former members and scholars alike as, as a critical error that made the organization vulnerable to infiltration and under, undermine the building of a disciplined and united political organization. During the period, <clears throat> during the, period the young lords like the Black Panther Party um, wagered that their organization's military-style structure would counter the inherent instability of these elements. The Lumpen thesis was an attempt, ultimately unsuccessful, to respond to a stubborn reality. The, the general Cold War retreat of the U.S. working class and its unions from any, any sustained challenge to capitalism. White working class backlash to, prote to, protest, um, to protest by people of color and the and persistence of racism in, in the unions. Late 1960s radicals were influenced by the, by, the, by the pessimism that permeated new left circles regarding the possibility of a worker-led ch challenge to capitalism. These were the result of the McCarthy-era purge of socialist and communist organizations from the unions. Variations of this idea were echoed by major new left theorists and philosopher um, Herbert, Herbert Marcuse. Marcuse. Marcus, dissident soci um, sociologist C. Wright Mills, sociologist Daniel Bell, and Marxist and Marxists Ball Baron and Paul Sweezy. The unprecedented increase in living standards among uh, um, among U.S. workers during the post-war World II economic boom, coupled with the rise of, so of social democratic governments in much of Europe during the same period, persuaded many radicals and conservatives alike that capitalism had found a way of circumventing deep economic crisis and sharp class conflict. Nope, that's bullshit. <laughs> However, working class consciousness was in flux as evident as 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 evidenced by the, by the upsurge of organizing and strike activity of the late 1960s and 70s, especially in France. This development challenged the new left's assessment of working, of working class consciousness and led many radicals to reevaluate their ideas. By 1969, the U.S. economy, overheated by the war, had stopped yielding the huge profits of the early 1960s and was do dogged um, by inflation and stagnation. In attempts to uh, um, in attempts to re um recuperate, recuperate profits, empl um employers mandated 
uh, mandated production line and quote unquote speed ups in response to increased output demands, dis- discrimination in the workplace, and an unresponsive union bureaucracy. Young workers who had been radicalized by the Black Power movement and the Vietnam War organized, uh, organized unauthorized, unauthorized quote wildcat strikes in several regions of the of the country. As children of poor working class Puerto Rican parents, it was not long before the young lords acknowledged that the that that the that the um affluence of some American workers was relative, temporary, and by no means un, un, uniform with with that class. These ideas had been reinforced through the young lords' collaboration with a group of Black American and Latin X workers involved in campaigns. For improved working conditions and patient care in the city's um, municipal hospital, as noted previously, as noted previously in fall 1969, the network of young lawyers work the network of young um, of young hospital workers had been had been, frust- had been frustrated by the limitations of the union's advocacy on behalf of its last pay of its least paid workers and sought to bridge community and workplace struggles. Because the young lords were involved in activism um, at three different um, hospital sites, um, Governor, Governor, yeah, Governor Hospital on the Lower East Side, Metropolitan Hospital in East Harlem, and Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx, they facilitated a a conversation among these Black American and Latin X workers. And encourage them to formalize their common um, um, pre, um, pre, preoccupations through organizing, through organization. Does anyone else want to read, or do I? Or if not, I'll continue reading. I'll go read. Right on. Right on. Wait, what page? What page are we on? Um, um, Shanti May is, is screen sharing. Okay. Oh wait, wait, wait. Right. Um, is that where is that where we're supposed to stop? Let me let me see. Or no? No, not, yeah. no, 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 not yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Imitating ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna start reading. <laughs> Disseminating ideas. <clears throat> Disseminating ideas in early winter 1970. The YLO began to transform its mimograph newsletter into a tabloid style bilingual newspaper. Palante, the word palante is the informal Spanish contradiction for. Is that the word's contradiction, right? Contraction. 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 Okay, my bad. Because my, my phone has cracks. So, like, my bad. Uh, contraction for the words. Para, I don't speak Spanish. That contradicts, that contract, ooh, that contraction is most often used in the colloquialism "ecachar palante," which means to push forward, a figure of speech for, con- for the concept of advancing in struggle, usually of a personal kind against the odds. The New York Young Lords envisioned Palante as their tool for staying connected and in conversation with the community. Because of the high level of politic because of the high level of political debate engendered by the events of that period, alternative newsletters were plentiful and considered an important means of re Redacting the masses, re educating, re educating my bad. Okay, of re educating the masses about the issues in 1969, the quote unquote issues in 1969. More than 500 alternative papers were in circulation nationally, not including high school publications, which numbered 500 to 1,000. Many of these publications had consist had consistent runs, but a specific but a significant number of them, like the Chicago groups YLO, were irregular and short lived. 
nothing the chronically inconsistent distribution of the organization's national newspaper. The New York Young Lawyers decided to generate their own news slogan, their own news organ, their own news organ. But doing it themselves soon revealed the labor-intensive requirements of newspaper productions from the editorial demands of a newspaper and the gathering of internationally commissioned and submitted articles and artwork to begin designs and layouts publishing a regular newspaper. Mimeograph old school. Okay, cool. That's what a mimeograph is. Um, demands experience a range of technical skills. So the to create a newspaper demands experience a range of technical skills, organization, planning ahead, staying on top of the news, strict deadlines, and more. Pablo Guzman served as editor of the paper. Denise Oliver, who studied in the competitive specialized high school art and design, remembers, I was the only member trained in graphics and design, so I did the first layouts and produced a lot of its artwork. She would later train Richie Perez in these areas. It wasn't long before the news it wasn't long before the New York group fell behind. In fact, Palante took six months to begin meeting its regular publication deadlines. Although the New Young Lords prioritized its publication, Palante endured several periods of inconsistency after 1971 during times of political disorientation and after 1972 as a result of splits within the organization that are described in later chapters. The newspaper was published twice a month, and all of its articles appeared simultaneously in Spanish and English. With little to no experience in newspaper production or training in journalism, the approximately 10 young radicals who were on the Palante team at any given time worked doubly hard to produce one of the few bilingual newspapers of the period. No accomplishments for an organization, no small accomplishment for an organization with few members who were fluent or formally trained in Spanish. In April 1970, the Young Lord's new branch office in the South Bronx became the informal center that house the newspaper's production. During its first two years, Palante was printed in color. Unrestrained by commercial standards, the paper brought together an array of eclectic eclectic graphics, photography, and rich renderings of art, rich renderings of art from the grassroots. Oliver produced some of its most mem- memorable graphics, among them a depiction of Lincoln Hospital with two nefarious looking pigs operating on a human. The young politicized arts and printers at Taller, Bor- I actually really Bor- can't read. also furnished the dramatic artwork that graced the covers of Blante. One cover reproduced Marco's Demi's De- portrait of Ramos Raymond. In material but tennis, the 19th century revolutionary doctrine and abolitionist who led the first armed revolt against Spanish rule in Puerto Rico. 
at its best. Palanta addressed social problems with humor. In one cartoon, a skeleton is slumped on a chair with a plump nurse holds on to a clip where... Ooh, nope. In one cartoon, a skeleton is slumped on a chair while a plump nurse holds on to a clipboard in the background. Its caption reads, The Long Wait. The distribution of Pilate was at once a political requisite for membership and a means of subsequence of subsistence and a means of subsistence for individual young Lord members. Well, Members walked a regular newspaper route and on a good day could sell between 100 and 200 copies of the newspaper at 25 cents each. They were allowed to keep half the proceeds. The practice of selling the newspaper and engaging new neighbors in the same city blocks week after week helped the establishment of the Young Lords as committed activists with print runs of 24,000 at the peak of Palante's circulation was impressive for an underground newspaper. Raymond Morales and Huey Jung organized its distribution and circulation respectively conceived as a vehicle through which to make the organization's ideas accessible to ordinary people. Pilate carried articles outlining the organization's positive people. Pilate carried articles outlining the organization's pot position position on the key issues of the day the sources of women's oppression the logic of revolutionary nationalism the meaning and manifestations of class the emergence of racism in the americas in the context of slavery and the uses of armed struggle among other subjects reporting on demonstrations and campaigns they initiated the paper, also kept the community informed. The paper also kept the community informed of the young lawyers' activities. Despite their strong support for armed rebellion, the new the young lords believed that education was the first step in revolution. Palante embodied this idea with numerous feature articles on Puerto Rico's history and radical tradition from the Spanish conquest of the deleterious effects of Operation. What's that word? Dele- Oosh, that? Deleterious? Deleterious? I don't even think I know what that word is, but deleterious. Why, but. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, effects of Electrics. operation. We got a definition. No. Okay. okay. Operation bootstrap, which just means bad. Obviously, operation bootstrap of the previous decade. The articles highlighted the early upheaval against colonial rule at the birth and evolution of the nationalist movement of the island. Plante also depict the dictated Palato, Palate also dictated several pages per issue to third world revolutionary struggles mostly in East Asia and Latin America it is very in its totality the newspaper offered a respiratory res, or something of unrelenting political analysis on local and global politics and a radical historical survey of a third world peoples and their struggles for freedom. As a publication, Blante soared as quickly as did the Young Lords and became a crucial 
vehicle through which the organization achieved recognition within the Puerto Rican community and the broader movement. Filled with images of resistance and brain brash. Oh, cool. Filled with images of resistance and brash denunciations of politicians, the bourgeoisie of all races, bought off union bureaucrats, quote-unquote, and the police, known as the pigs. So do y'all want to talk here? Or, like, I could keep reading it, or I think someone texted that they want to read. So what do you guys want to do? Well, I was hoping, um, I was hoping we get Comrade Sean to get involved in reading because um, uh, he did offer. I think we only have two pages left, so thanks yeah, for exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I was going to say you. that... W- I was going to say that we usually um, end um, the sections that we're reading and then we end up talking afterwards. Oh, God. Um, I could finish this, but I mean, he going to have like a page. If he doesn't mind, I don't mind. No, I don't it, it, it's fine. I don't mind reading. Um, I just wanted to congratulate you on like actually making it through some of those extremely difficult words. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate uh, you. And and my and, the, and the, my, literally my whole phone screen is cracked. So like sometimes oh, I literally just can't read it. Like my phone yeah, screen is, cra- is cracked too. Yeah, <laughs> but it's all cool. We definitely we definitely yeah. did it. So we put through. We did it. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Moving forward, Palante was open and unapologetic. Its partiality towards the dispossessed classes at a moment when class struggle was at its highest level since immediately after World War II and the structural inequality was acknowledged by even mainstream academics and politicians, underground newspapers like Palante uh, reveled in taking sides and pulling no punches. Candid in its aims, the paper sought to advance the fighting spirit and revolutionary consciousness of working class Puerto Ricans and other exploited and oppressed peoples. Completely unrestrained by the conventions of journalism, a cross-section of young lords reported on their actions in different political campaigns. From community health, for example, support for striking workers in the Bronx at the Art Steel Factory, in prose that was fervent and youthful in its honesty, the paper possessed an intrepid style of reporting that challenged the notions of politics as the domain of experts and professionals and opened up a forum where an unlikely uh, unlikely segment of the population, young, poor, and brown, spoke up. Yet the create creativity and dissent were not without shortcomings. Periodicals such as Palante reflected the bravado of, of youthful radicals. Impatience in seeking to bring about change combined with a lack of political sophistication, often produce a righteous and preachy tone in Palante's reporting. For example, the newspaper ran a, a number of editorials and... Con- <laughs> Waiting for it to stop moving. Okay. Um, I lost my spot. Condemning oh. comments. Uh... Uh, okay. Um, for example, the newspaper ran a number of editorials condemning such behavioral tendencies within the Puerto Rican community, such as widespread tolerance of mistresses among married men, or the routine practice among young working class Puerto Ricans of seeking division and escape on the, uh, sorry, diversion and escape on the dance floor. Although these articles attempted to locate the social origins of human behavior and understand the patterns of negative interaction between men and women, they sometimes uh, lapsed into condescension and moralizing, not unlike the previous uh, generation of middle-class Puerto Rican reformers that the young lords often criticized. Palante's tone was common in the quasi-evangelical uh, quality of much of, of much 1960s radicalism, 
with its tendency to substitute individual commitment, self-sacrifice, and upright behavior for objective political assessment and analysis of social phenomena, such, uh, such as, for example, Marx's theory of alienation under capitalism. For the period's cadre organizations, the process uh, process of internal transformation was refracted through the ego stripping Maoist exercise known as criticism and self criticism. As Oliver explained, if a member violated the codes of conduct, you were given criticism and you had to stand up there and criticize yourself. I am guilty of putting my party at risk. I am guilty of betraying the trust of my comrades. Uh, revolutionary commitment was measured by a member's willingness to change their behavior and accept discipline. M members were also expected to call out bad behavior. Those who failed to do so were said to be liberal. Oliver continues, that was the worst thing you could call somebody. It was straight from Chairman Mao and drummed into our heads. Liberalism is corrosive. It enables bad behavior and sets the socialist project back. Some people stepped up to the plate and were not liberal. There were also there was also anger and resentment. The practice blurred the boundaries between principle and self righteousness. A shortcoming of Palante, as as of many radical publications of the period, was a lack of analy analytical depth in its critique of American society. Publications were good at identifying the enemy, but provided little in the way of understanding the specificity of American politics and, assume, uh, and assessing the movement on both the national and local levels. <laughs> Yet the paper's bold and straightforward approach to reporting pro uh, projected the organization's unshakable resolve and serious commitment. Ooh, how exciting. <laughs> um, the large influx of new members in the early 1970 or in early 1970 meant it was time for the young lords to expand. The organization had spread in fits and starts with activists opening satellite offices, the first of which was established in Newark in fall 1969. But the young lords grew uh, qualitatively. The YLO field ministry, led by David Perez, emerging as a new vital area worked. The field ministry identified new sites and neighborhoods for the organization's work and managed the process of setting up new branches. According to Iris Morales, Perez would go out and just be with those areas for a while, get to know the local folks, and assess if this should be a chapter or not. Uh, did it look like they were solid? Uh, comrade. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, I was going to say that that is where we stop. Oh, um, we, okay. Um, um, the, the May 1970 retreat and the Young Lords Party um, is, for the, is for the next reading. Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, we did it. <laughs> we got through it. <laughs> I'd have just kept going. <laughs> I, I had to double check. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> um, that would love to hear everyone's thoughts. I want, I want we just read. I know that I have a lot of thoughts. Um, and as always, um, we got we have Comrade Che here, and I especially want want, want to hear his thoughts on, on what we read. <laughs> oh yeah, that's fucking new. Hey, Comrade Che, how are you doing? Sorry. You doing good, Comrade? Uh, Comrade Che, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. What's up, Comrade? No, I just wanted to ask, are you doing okay? Um, is everything... Um, how are you feeling, man? Yeah, I'm. I'm doing okay. I'm. I'm. I'm just planning for the yada man. It's, it's, ha it's happening on on September 9th, and I'm gonna be uh flying out of here uh September eighth. 
So I'm going to be uh, in New York City between September 8th, 9th, and September 10th. Then I'm coming back. So, uh, but right I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna be one of the first speakers who's gonna set the set the set fire to the masses. Right on. <laughs> I'm gonna, right on. I'm gonna wake them up. <laughs> they just, I already, I'm gonna wake, them, wake them, up. them up, Jay. That's right. I'm gonna wake them up. Because <laughs> oh, the man, thing shit. is, I'm gonna. They're gonna give. The lawyers, the lawyers are going to give me a a, a a t-shirt to put on, and and on that t-shirt it says Attica is all of us, and that's how I'm going to start. You know, I'm right going to make on. people say, "We right are human beings. We are human beings. We are human beings. We are human beings." And then I'm going to break that down so that they know what that's all about and what Attica fought against. You know, because we fought against all human inhumanities and, and atrocities, you know, and we want to be human beings. So I'm going to let the people know that everything that happens in prisons happens in the city, in the streets. You know, there's no difference between society and prisons. No difference. There's no difference. There is none. Um... There is none. Um, one, um, um, to mention something about th this book that I really loved, I really loved how they went into the lump and proletariat, right? Because yeah. for a lot, because, because a lot of things a lot of people don't know is that Karl Marx actually disliked the lump and proletariat. He only saw them, um, he, um, um, as they were, as they were saying here, the lump and proletariat is easily, Manipulated um, by political ideology to be both to be either revolutionary or reactionary, and Karl Marx only saw the lump and proletariat um, as um, as petty criminals who were being used against um, the um, the working class, the, the the part of the proletariat that, that that's still employed. But he didn't understand why. There was so much impoverishment. Why there was so much petty crime within the lump and proletariat? Mao and Fanon, on the other hand, um, gave a more gave a more principled analysis on the lump and proletariat and why there's so much crime within the lump and proletariat because they have been kicked out of the capitalist machinery. They are no longer considered exploitable, or or they're no longer considered exploitable by the bourgeois. And so, um, and so, and so they have been kicked out, or um, they have either been kicked out, or or are extremely under underpaid, but um, but um, by the bourgeois, which makes them simultaneously um have the most revolutionary potential out of anyone within the working class because they have nothing to lose. They um they, um they um they have no they have no. They have no benefit to gain from this capitalist imperialist system. They have been uprooted from the capitalist. Um, um, they have been uprooted by, by the capitalist machine because because they're no longer seen as useful. They're no longer seen as, as exploitable. And just like how they can show the most reactionary behavior, they can also show the most revolutionary behavior. It just depends on who gets to them first, you know, and how you go about it. So yeah. You were gonna say something, Shanti? Especially on the part where they talked about the poppy flowers, because I had no idea about the poppy flowers, you know, heron coming from the poppy flowers. But I think this also brings into another uh point, another important point that a lot of us choose to not even like understand. These plants have been used as class warfare since the beginning of modern capitalism, of colonialism. Um, alcohol being used against native people to keep them, you know, subdued um, as means of class control. Um, cocaine used against uh, enslaved indigenous Africans to keep them working on the field. Heroin uh, from the poppy flowers used as means of trying to exterminate an entire generation of colonized Jews, especially 
um, before the, the so-called war on drugs, if you can even call it that, was even declared. So this also brings up a point of our own nature being used by the bourgeois forces as weapons of class warfare. And that's what the lump and proletariat is still facing, especially with the opioid crisis. And people wonder why there's still problems. This is your answer. This is your answer. So don't pretend that you don't know what's going on because you do know what's going on. You know where they're coming from. You just don't want to deal with it because it's easier to blame the lump and proletariat, especially colonized lump and proletariats for these problems as if it's a matter of character. It's not a matter of character. It's a matter of class. That is what it is. And you know it. You knew it from the uh, heroin epidemic. You knew it from the, uh, the crack crisis and the opioid crisis. They know the root causes. They just want to put it on the lump of military because it's much more easier to blame them than the root causes of the problem with uh, racialized oppression and capitalism. Exactly. Uh, let me say something in reference to that. I like I like that. That was very well put. Uh, our, our environments are violent by nature. It was created by capitalism. And, right. and once it created those violent environments, they put people in those violent environments and created what is known as the lump and proletariat. The lump and proletariat is not, it's not at fault for their own creation. They didn't create themselves. They were created by the enemy, you know, and a lot of people, a lot of our people, you know, poor people, especially, who lost their jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't have nothing else to do but to run in the streets and, 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 and shoot up and all that stuff. That wasn't, they're victims of that, of, of that violent nature of, of capitalism because capitalism created those situations, you know? Thank so I, on that point, I sort of like, I, I differ with Marx because Marx is talking from a, one era of time you know, now we have to look at it from this area of time. We have to look at the situation involved. You know, yep. so the lumber proletariat, yeah, they they could become enemies. Yes, they could become enemies, and they could be infiltrated. Yes, they could. But just keep in mind one thing: that they are a creation of the capitalists. The capitalists created them. You know, I mean, yep. they come from a violent environment, which is people mad for the violent environment to do, but to react and, and rebel in various forms. Besides the rebel, revolution, they rebel in various forms. And this is one of their ways of rebelling by shooting drugs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. Exactly. And this is what we have been saying for years, but we have been so brainwashed because there's no systems, uh, revolutionary systems put in place that we point the wrong we put our fingers at the wrong people all these years, knowing the root causes, knowing that it could have saved us a whole bunch of time. They just don't want to deal with the reality of what the root uh, causes of the problem are. They wonder why, you know, there's so many people addicted to drugs. They wonder why there's so many people who are alcoholics. They wonder why there's so many people raping each other, grooming each other, sexually molesting each other. They wonder why. They wonder why. They wonder why, um, you know, there's poor people going up against um, working class uh, people at Walmart or at Target or at a, a local corner store. They wonder why those conditions are the way they are, because that's what capitalism relies on. They rely on the condition of violence within each other, within the lump of proletariat in order to justify its existence, to justify its power, to justify um, it's domination. And that's what a lot of us have not been able to still understand. It's right yeah, there. So. It's right yep. there in front of you. It doesn't take a book of theory to understand this. They know nope. the root causes. They just don't want to yeah. deal with it. Yeah. You know, lumpy proletariat is a creation of capitalism. Yep. That's basically it. Look at that's it. It's a creation of capitalism. That's it. Mm -hmm. There's there's literally no other. There's literally no other reason for this. 
There's no other reason. It's not because of some 10 year old. It's not because of some 15 year old. It's not because of a 19 year old. It's not because of me. I did not create this. I don't have the power to, you know, create these conditions. It's the bourgeois forces that have um, implemented every single uh, piece of their dominance into our conditions. It's yeah. that, not me. I didn't create this. A 19 year old being blamed for, you know, <laughs> conditions, <laughs> capitalism, how violent, how false, how um, misguided is that? And it's so funny when you think about it because once again, they love to point the finger at the youth, at us. Yeah, yep, yep. they do. That they That's allow the, the conditions that they have allowed, and they used to be children themselves. How funny! How very, very funny! Because the uh, same problems that they pointed at us for causing is the same problems that happened in their generation, in the generation, uh, the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation up to us. We're not mm -hmm. responsible for this. The bourgeois forces that have destroyed our civilizations, destroyed our history, uh, turned us against each other for the past 531 years. They yeah. did not us. No, 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 no cap. You also need to understand one thing that, that infiltrators in our organizations were created by who? The bourgeois. Call Pro. Call mm -hmm. tell Pro. Pro yeah i also also like something like in the book they were talking about like how like they were doing like like they were selling newspapers in the community i thought that was like a really interesting way of like alienating themselves from each other and like connecting with like different people because like, mm -hmm. like that's something i realized like in like modern day grassroots isn't like the same it's like they don't have like just people walking down the street handing out newspapers so i thought that was interesting and like that was a good way for like the youth to show themselves off and represent themselves in a positive way by like handing out like informational like newsletters from a youth right perspective on. exactly and as y'all were saying as y'all were saying um the bourgeois created the urban proletary because under this capitalist imperialist system it creates poverty it creates impoverishment because there's only one thing that the bourgeois want at the end of the day to maximize profit in the most quickest and efficient way of possible regardless of how many people die or suffer that it. It. They, they they benefit from this they benefit simultaneously from um from getting colonized communities addicted to um to drugs because because, because it confuses distorts <laughs> and misdirects these colonized communities and simultaneously as they're getting them addicted to these drugs they're also simultaneously making these drugs illegal so that way so so um so, so that way so, so that way said people of the colonized um community are are incarcerated are thrown to prison and and and, and they're and, they, and their labor and their labor is stolen exactly for nothing that, that that's the whole point and it creates impoverishment it's a it's a cycle of oppression, subjugation, and exploitation based on profit. That's that 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 that's that's literally it. These that's drug, it. these drug wars that 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 they do, they are the ones that create drug addictions. Then simultaneously make make, make those drugs um illegal. Then um then engage in mass incarceration in these communities, which causes which causes further um. Um, further impoverishment, further poverty, which causes them to, to resort to petty crime to survive, which causes them to get incarcerated and, and causes um, their labor to be stolen in prisons to maximize profit. That's it. That's really it. it. Also, it's Comrade just... Joe. Oh, sorry. I was going to say also, Comrade Joe, you've had your hand up for a little bit. So I wanted to let you talk. Well, you know, I'm, I'm patient. So, uh, but sometimes if I don't say what I want to say, uh, I'll forget what the heck I was going to say. But uh, I wanted to touch back on the book too, and like, oh, and, and thank, uh, thank you, Comrade Isa, for joining us today and uh, being one of the hosts and uh, or uh, <coughs> of today, and, uh, and and Comrade Sean for reading also. Uh, but going back to and today's uh, reading, and one of the things that stood out to me also was 
uh, the Palante newspaper that they had written. Um, and I thought that was pretty powerful because just prior to even joining today's uh, study group, I was reviewing a documentary, which I put up on my Brown Beret page. And hopefully y'all can check it out because uh, the Chicanos in East L.A. were also doing something like that. It was called La Raza. Um, so, and at the same time, and how, you know, pictures and and artwork and, and stuff like that was able, and then, and, and um, topics of that, of that that period of time or things to bring into notice were brought out in this newspaper so that the masses can see it. And that's what they had to do in that time because they didn't have social media. Uh, so that was like one of the, you know, first things that to reach the masses, to get it out there is to do newspapers. And I was thinking like how powerful for us to bring uh, a newspaper in, in today's times uh, that, that would be beneficial. I mean, and then we, we might not be able to sell it like on the street corners, like in those times, but we can, uh, definitely put it out there online and it can just reach even more of the masses. So one of the things in that documentary that I was paying attention to earlier, I didn't know that the young lords in 1970, a few of them, they said, came to East Los Angeles for the first Chicano moratorium that they were fighting against uh, the Vietnam War and the injustices that were going on in the school and the public school systems and uh, and then the rights for an equal education and, and so forth and so forth, higher education, where they would just give us a, a, a trade schools, not even trying to set us up to go to college because they said we were not college material. Uh, that, that I thought was really, really powerful and to find out that the young lords came to East LA in 1970 which goes to show what they were really trying to do when, when this this book was being written and, and, and bringing forth, uh, bringing a unity. Because it, it showed also where, you know, at first, uh, the, the not understanding of we're going to work with whites, we're not going to work with whites, some people don't want to work with right, white people. And then they mentioned something within, in Alcatraz, um, I think that was in, I, I want to say 72 or 73, uh, where they made it more of a, a all peoples and more of a solidarity type of thing. And that, and then that's, that's what we're working on today. Um, the solidarity within our different formations, within our different uh, organizations. And I just thought, I, I gathered those two things off of uh, today's reading. And then I was saying, well, how can we apply it today? Because the same things that were going on with the gorilla on the back, which was heroin, which was even being brought in uh, from back to Vietnam. And, and then they were giving it to the Vietnam soldiers or making it accessible to the Vietnam soldiers that got hooked and then brought that whole uh, that whole plague of heroin back with but now we, I like I would say, we're doing today with fentanyl. The opioid crisis is very much alive today in our communities. But now they call it blues and this and that. They don't call it H or or the gorilla on your back or the monkey on your back or or brown or whatever. Uh, so, kind of kind of relates and correlates to today's times. And then at the same time when we were talking about the war on drugs. I know uh, the war on a lot of drugs were or were in the 20s and 30s were made uh, illegal because uh, prior to that they were still having cocaine and Coca Cola and it wasn't until Reagan and Nancy Reagan um, where they did the war on drugs which was just another thing of incarcerating and targeting our communities. At, and then bringing us down, because like the, the, in this chapter, it says, uh, we didn't bring those 30 tons of heroin uh, to the United States. Just like nowadays, they don't, who, who is the, who's the makers of the fentanyl? Who's the makers of all these other opioid uh, 
whatever uh, uh, derivatives of whatever pill or whatever whatever it's called nowadays, because they have several different names. Um, let it stay strong, and I'll let it go because I like to hear everybody else talking too. Let it go right now, but um, let us stay strong. Let us keep our boots on the ground, and um, let revolutionary love, all power, all power. All power. Right beautifully said, beautifully said, comrade. And you're 100 correct. And as you were saying with the um the newsletter, for their time, that's how they were able to get to the masses, you know. But within our materials and conditions, we have to adapt our theory and those strategies to our current materialistic conditions. And now that we have the internet. At our disposal, at our disposal, we can get to so many people and engage in cultural revolution like never before. You know, using art, literature, poetry, um, music, and language, and so on and so forth. You know, that's how we're gonna do this. You know, so um, so so and and with that and with that newsletter that they were engaging in combined with the culture same thing that the black panthers were, were doing with their newsletter and with emory douglas we, we we need to advance how we implement cultural revolution to our community how we how we use art music and so on and so forth to radicalize the masses to, to to psychologically decolonize them and to encourage them to relearn and see and see things through a principled and scientific way through a scientific analysis of things. That's what we gotta do. Yep. And that's exactly that's exactly what we talked about the other day. If yep. you don't use your culture, if you don't use your roots as an active revolutionary materialist base, actively, the key word, mm -hmm. actively, you're doomed. Because it's only yep. going to be ornamental and recreational not revolutionary and liberatory. That's the mm -hmm. difference. Just like I said with the Asada Shakur uh, example, you know, she changed her name while she was uh, attending community college in Manhattan, but she still was a revolutionary. She's still doing the work in Cuba, li living it up and doing the work. That's the difference. You can change, you can, you can do all the name changes all you want, but if you don't actively have that principled revolutionary base you you're change you're reclaiming your identity who you truly are for just ornamental recreational purposes not revolutionary that is the main difference right on well said. if you're not if you're not using your culture alongside the gun that's not revolutionary you know you can't um you can't have you cannot have cultural liberation without also having without also having economic social and political liberation we we need to combat this socioeconomic system on all fronts on all levels combat all the contradictions of capitalism we, we need to have economic social cultural and political liberation not just one but all for um for we'd have we'd, we'd have liberation um for everyone and incorporate and, and, and incorporate um the the strategies to come to combat capitalism on every level you know and to avoid ethnocentricity at all costs because ethnocentricity is I mean, we all know what it is. Um, yep. we, we, you know, the Hebrew Israelite, you know, cult, you know, we know what it is. Um, mm -hmm. We avoid that at all costs as well because ethnocentricity is death, is automatic death to the plight for revolution. It's, it's, it's literally like revolutionary suicide, essentially. Essentially like um, ethnocentric um, plight that kills the potential for a full throttle revolution that sticks. And, you know, once again, we've seen many, many examples of that through the years, 
We all know what it is. We know um, that ethnocentrists are fascist too. They are not afraid either. And so it's very important that we avoid any form of ethnocentricity at all costs because that is um, that is death of a revolution. I, I'm glad the way you put it like that and you brought that out, revolutionary suicide. Uh, you know, you were mentioning books uh, when we had our first discussion. Um, do you know about that book or have you looked into it? Because I suggested it for one of the future readings here on the Rainbow Coalition. And, um, and which book? I believe Revolutionary it's Suicide. Revolutionary Suicide. By U.P. Um, Newton, though. Yeah, yes. that's in my book list, too. Yep. Oh, okay. And, um, okay, cool. and Seas of Time. Right yep. on, right on. But um, what, 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 I'll just be brief, too, because I don't like to, I like to hear more than I talk. But um, when we bring that today, like some of the people say, when we're doing stuff and like, uh, of course, I'm always like, viva la raza and que viva la causa. Um, but, I, and I've mentioned this plenty of times and I'll mention it here one more time. If we get ethnocentric and we only can, can, can take in consideration of our ethnicities and not take into consideration of the community and whole, because what affects the community affects all of us. I don't care what color you are, what uh, income status you have, or what your sexual preference. It has nothing to do with that. And so we always have to be inclusive of the peoples in order to make revolutionary change. And that is all. Yep. Right on. I see, I see right on. Uh, comrade Isa said he has to go. Uh, so thank you for being here and hope to see you uh, next time. That's all. See you, comrade. See you, comrade yeah. Issa. It was a pleasure uh, talking to you, man. I appreciate you all, and I appreciate the the hospitality and the growth and the knowledge. So, talk to you all soon. Revolutionary all love, all power, peace, all power, peace. But no, yeah, exactly what what you guys were saying. You know, at the end of the day, if our movement is truly scientific and principled and dialectical. Its primary focus, the root of it, is internationalist and, and, and intercommunalist. It cannot be based on just purely the deliberation of one nation, but of all nations, all people. That's what it needs to be based on. If, you're, um, if your movement is truly a proletarian movement, then you want deliberation for all the proletarian, for the global proletarian, not just the one in the U.S., but but um, but the one in every nation, as well. If that is not the root, if you are not helping other communities, other movements, other um other genuine revolutionary um or organizations, and you're only focused on the liberation of your of your of your nation, your community, without without the liberation of everyone then you're not revolutionary. You're reactionary. Simple as that. For, um, freedom is only privilege extended unless it's enjoyed by one and all. Simple as that. Let me say something. Yeah. You know, back a few years ago, well, I, I, I go back like 50, 25 years ago. You know, when I was living in the city, I was living in Brooklyn. And uh, me and some of some. You there? Uh, hello? Can anyone hear me? We can hear you just fine. I think his uh, okay. service <laughs> dropped. Yeah, he's I in the Dominican working. Republic, so uh, his service yeah. is there. So when he comes I back was... on, jump right in, Chip. That's all. Yeah, I was worried because I'm like, fuck, did I fucking internet drop again? Oh my god. <laughs> but um but yeah, this reading is awesome. Y'all, I really love this. And Sean Team and Am, so yep, Shay disconnected. Um, and I love all I love everything that they all say and Shanti May as always, um, you always word things perfectly and beautifully. You're awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>
Does it? Do any one of you guys have anything else to mention? I'm going to have to be getting heading out pretty soon, but I wanted to be patient and let uh, Comrade Che come back on and see what he had to say. I got. I'm going to go visit my mama. Right on. Um, another thing that I want to know. I want, another thing that I wanted to, to say that 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 I just remembered, and we, and we were getting into it. Um, no knock warrant originated from the war on drugs, which, by the way, not a lot of people know this. But 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 Biden himself w was a part of that whole policy, the war on drugs. He actually participated in it. He was. Yep. He was. And a lot of people like to gloss over the fact that he's this lesser evil. And, you know, he's, you know, um, like so great, including Kamala Harris, even though she, you know, you know, we know what happened in with her time as an attorney in California. We know what happened. So mm -hmm. the fact that they love to gloss over that fact, they're doing it on purpose because they know that if we call out these contradictions, they're they're contra they're they're walking contradictions, okay? That's what they are. Mm -hmm. They're walking contradictions. They know that when we call them out, that we will be neutralized for it because we're resisting against what they're already doing now what they've been doing the fascist reaction reactionary um empire that is the united states that we made while literally being commodified off our bodies kidnapped genocided and you know placed in these class ranks to justify their domination it's literally not that hard to understand. And the fact that Joe Biden was involved in the so-called wrong drugs, or I should call class warfare against the lumpen proletariat, really, um, that's what it should be called. You know, it's like, come on, come on. It's not that hard to understand this, these things. And the fact that they love to revise history on that shows you that they know that they're fully in the know about this entire system in general, not just Biden, not just Harris, not just Reagan, um, not just Nixon. It's the whole entire system, a whole entire history. They know. They just love to cross over it because, you know, they love to protect, you know, their so-called lesser evil or whatever, you know, whatever BS they want to promote about you know the government and stuff but the same thing applies yep and he, and and i always hated that whole fucking lesser evil thing because because even if they are the quote unquote lesser evil which they aren't even if they are the lesser evil they're still evil you're still choosing they're evil still like 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 that like it doesn't make sense to me why the fuck is our only options shit or more shit. Why can't it not just be good? Why can we not have um why can we not have an option that is for the best of the whole society? Why why is our options um shit or shit or shittier? Like 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 that doesn't make any sense to me. If you genuinely believe in that whole lesser evil bullshit, you're part of the problem. You don't you're want change. Part of the problem. You're part of the problem. And if you think that going to the voting ballots Every four years makes yourself a revolutionary, you're really, really sorely mistaken because yep. you know that no matter how many times you vote, you will still be killed. Mm -hmm. You are fully aware of it. You are fully aware of it in 2012. You are fully aware of it in 2016. You are fully aware of it in 2020. You are fully aware of it. You know it. But you don't want to do a damn thing about it because you're so afraid that if you speak out and put your butt on the ground and say that enough is enough, when you start seeing that the voting ballot is ammunition against your life, the voting ballot is ammunition against our lives. That is what it is. Voting in a capitalist, imperialist society 
does nothing but add ammunition to your life and to our earth, our nature, our land. And y'all are fully aware of this. It divides but, people. It divides people. It fools people. That's the point. But like once again, you can vote however many times you want. As long as these systems still exist, you will continue to delude yourself on purpose into thinking that going to the voting ballot is going to save you? Really? Really? Have we seen what happened uh, when they uh, declared the pandemic quote-unquote over? That whole thing about these essential workers, oh, they're so amazing. That's a whole why because a lot of those essential workers are part of the problem too because a lot of them wanted that pandemic to be declared quote-unquote over. They just need a bourgeois entity to declare it over so I don't have to deal with all the, you know, dead, you know, all the uh, sick bodies in droves going going to the hospitals with no infrastructure, mind you, no infrastructure at all. Like like they wanted that to be over. They just wanted someone to declare it over, and look at what happened: the COVID nineteen levels and the wastewater rising. Um, the rate the cases are going back up. I mean. Anything that they take from these bourgeois entities, they'll follow because they don't know how to think. They don't know how to think because those systems haven't been put in place for so long. They think that everything is just normal, that violence for the sake of violence, especially from capitalist entities is normal. It's not normal and they're fully aware of it. And they know that with everything that's happened this year, it should be the last straw for everyone. It should be the last straw for everyone. You should be crying right now. You should feel rage. You should feel angry that all the things, all this not progress that we have made has resulted in more death in our communities. Our communities they're being literally being in more disarray Cop cities popping up all over the damn place because you didn't want to put your foot down and say something. It's literally history repeating itself. It's literally not that hard to understand. It's literally not that hard to understand. The voting ballot, and I will say this again, as long as these systems exist, the voting ballot is ammunition against your life. Either yep. you Either you recognize it or you don't. But if you don't, then you're purposely choosing to literally be killed by the bourgeois forces no matter what, even if you're not actually dead. Mm. That's what it is. And they're really sad. Eh? I, I wanted to share a little something. I don't know if I can get in there. Sure. Can I have the floor, please? Oh, this happened. Uh, I'm in Southern California right now because I, like I mentioned, we came. I came to the Chicano Moratorium. Yeah. Uh, last Saturday, so I got to, most of my family live in California or Texas, but all my immediate family live in California. So uh, us as brothers have been allocated properties left over by my father, and they have. Uh, have been the, the city and the cops have been fighting us uh, for our properties. Now, a couple of nights ago, they came and said we were trespassing on one of our properties because they got a phone call. The police said they had a phone call that we are trespassing and we had to prove that that was our property. Well, we showed them the eviction that we gave to the previous people that were inhabiting our property illegally and that wasn't sufficient enough for them so they hauled two of my brothers away and they wanted to haul me away but uh being that i go on these study groups uh, my verbiage was a little more uh direct when when i and i and i specifically said what you guys are doing is illegal and you do expect to hear from some kind of lawyer because this is that you guys do this to the people and what we have to do is fight back for land back. 
in all our communities and self and self uh, determination and, and self sufficiency also when we do acquire our properties and whether it's the community gardens or, or whatever the case may be or exactly. just living off the grid um, not relying on the the water company the light company or any other company or any other entity that's dealing with any of these bourgeois businesses where the now people can't even afford their medication because you either have your lights on or you take your medication it's disgusting it's sickening it's disgusting it's sickening and you know to have control of native land really really right so so I'm, I'm we're really happy we're really working uh, we did bail out the two brothers uh, i said i have to go shortly um because we're gonna have a little weekend cookout at mom's house so we can all talk about what's going on within the family here in southern california i mean as much as i i love what's going on across the nation and other nations um but uh man it, it's just so unfair i mean like they can just push their weight around. And what they do is try to discourage us by any means necessary on their part. It's to, a psychological game. It's it is. It's all it's all a game. And then like there's there's somebody's holding those puppet strings and those cops and all those people are just puppets. Somebody's holding those those strings. But us as revolutionary fighters we have to stand up we have to stand up for our rights and whether it means going to jail whether it means uh by any means necessary on our part well then we have to because if we don't i don't see too many people standing up in line wanting to get make change and we'll so, collapse right on it as a species, as human beings, not only can we do better, we need to do better for Once ourselves, again. for the whole society, for nature, for everything. Because if we don't cause change, if we don't build a new socioeconomic system that provides for us within the means of our materialistic conditions, we are all going to perish. We that will, is going to happen. We will collapse under it. Yep. Because we because once again we want to keep we want to keep praying we want to keep going to these voting ballots thinking that a miracle is gonna happen, uh use our culture for recreational purposes thinking that we're going to get our land back no, no 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 that's not how that's gonna go down. We have to become principled. We have to become analytical. We have to become political. Enough people have to become principled and political enough so that they can be able to have uh, long-standing solutions for revolution for a new world because they know a new world is possible. It's just that collapsing under that psychological doom and wanting to escape reality, you know, not wanting to deal with it, you know, because escaping reality is ammunition for the capitalist system. We cannot yep. just keep leaving our uh, realities and think that something's going to happen. No, 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 no. Because the more we keep running away from our problems, the more ammunition they're going to have against the people, all people and all land. That is it. And the sooner that we confront our reality and be materialist for once, as Fred Hampton said, when we deal with what reality is, our reality, what's going on around us, not just what's in front of our eyes, <clears throat> then we can be able to make actual progress. But until we put, we collectively put their, uh, um, until more people put their foot down and proclaim for real, that enough is enough and start organizing and start becoming principled for a new world, for us to live, for all ecology to live, then we will continue to collapse. And that's and that's the truth. Whether you like mm -hmm. it or not, the truth. 
Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Also, Comrade Che, you were talking before, but then you ended up uh, le- leaving the call, man. I don't. I don't know what happened, man. You know, I. I just think that call to pro is just. No, it's yeah, what, it's, it's, it's the FBI. Working, you know? <laughs> it's the FBI, you know, man. It's the because I was FBI. the soon I said arms. You know, it just shut me right off, man. You know, but anyway, uh, so we went down to this neighborhood. Northern Avenue in Brooklyn. And we went into this house. It was all, you know, everybody met in the house was dealing and, you know, whatever. And we 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 put a demand. We made gave them an hour to leave the neighborhood, to leave the house. Period. If not, it was a game of cards. And uh an hour came and we saw all of them walk out. Out not only at the building, but out the neighborhood. And that's how we got to clean our neighborhood because we cannot, we cannot, under no circumstances, allow the pigs to clean the neighborhood because they're not going to clean it. They're just going to filter it more than what it is, you know. And again, you know, when speaking about lumping proletarians, they're victims, you know, they're not, they're not, they're, yeah, they're criminal school, you know. You know, many of us, man, went to prison as so-called criminals, but we were victims of a system. You know, I went to I went to prison for 15 years for for an attempt to murder on somebody who tried to kill me. But I was 14 at the time, and the system didn't care because I had a record. I already had a record that goes way back to when I was about seven years old. <laughs> you know, uh, so they gave me 15 years. But they also, they, they in a way, they, gave, they, they blessed me. You know why? Because when I went to prison, I became a revolutionary. It woke me up. You know, prison does a lot of things to you, yeah, but it also wakes you up, you know, and it woke me up. It made me who I became, a revolutionary, a determined revolutionary, one who was willing to give up his life at any moment for the people. You know, that's that's hard to say because at one time I couldn't say that. <laughs> I couldn't say that because I didn't I, I didn't believe in nothing. But as soon as the book uh, a book was given to me on, on, on Malcolm X, the autobiography of Malcolm X, and I read it, man, that shit woke me up. <laughs> that brother really, really, really woke me up. You know. And uh then when you know and you know, life goes on, man, but we got to clean our neighborhoods. We're the only ones that could do it. Always uh, a pleasure. Yeah, always, always a pleasure hearing from you, comrade. Yeah. I got I got one of my <laughs> younger brothers with me, and he's like, hey. "Who is that?" Guy? I said, "That's hey. Chip, man." Like, oh, hey. Hey. <laughs> Always nice to hear you uh, speak, man. You're you're so influential, and and I know you're gonna hit that speech. You're gonna you're gonna break it down gently to uh, over there in New York, man. I don't think I'm gonna be able to make it, to be honest with you, because I got to be in Albuquerque on the 15th and the 16th, and it's just hard to travel. Well, it's, gonna be, financial- it's gonna be it's gonna be in a church, you know, and, and so I gotta watch what I say because I can't curse in church. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> well, I'm told That's I can't impossible curse for me. I mean, that's impossible for me, too, because I'm going to be saying, motherfucker, wake up. You know, I'm going <laughs> to scream at people. I'm going to scream at people. It's going to be something, man, like a bomb going to blow. But, you know, but I'm going to tell them the truth, you know, because you got to tell the people the truth. You can't lie yeah. to them. You got to let them know what is, what is and what isn't. You know, yeah. they're, li- they're living a life that isn't. They need to wake up and live a life that is. Make them where they're at. Make them know once and for all. You know how Brother Mark used to talk? That's how I'm going to talk when I get up there. That's right. right That's on. right. Let them right know. On. They need, they need the psychological kick back into reality. Meet the people where they're at. They need to see it. They really need to see it because enough is enough. We're That's not that. waiting 50 more years. The time is now. Now or never. That's sad. That.
Oh man, it's hot as hell down here in this Dominican Republic, man. It's hot. <laughs> I can imagine. I no. can imagine, but no. Boy. But no, yeah, we in order to radicalize the masses, in order to elevate them, you have to meet the masses where they're at. You have to meet them within their materialistic conditions and materialistic needs. You have to meet them at where, where their knowledge is of class struggle. And you have to elevate them through struggling all, alongside them, showing them that the vanguard party is for them. Engaging in mass line and building connections with them, building survival programs, and taking the scattered ideas of your community and, transform, and transforming them into, 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 into revolutionary acts, transforming, transform, transforming them into organizational acts. And once the masses see that the party is for them, once they have been mentally decolonized, once they have observed the party um, um, providing for them, then they will then they then they will respect the party. Then they will begin engaging the ideological political line of the party. Then they will begin in having a dialectical materialist class analysis of their materialistic conditions of the internal contradictions within capitalism, within our society, the relation between those contradictions, how the how those contradictions affect our materialistic conditions. And how to and, and, and engage in the principles of Marxism and Pantherism to achieve a new society, a new socioeconomic system, a new mode of production, a new um, relation of production, new social relations, a new culture, and how to the, and, the, and how to the, and how to defend and uphold the revolutionary proletarian line. That's what we gotta do. We gotta show the people what what um what it means to self govern and 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 how to engage in self determination. Uh, comrade Sean, I haven't heard m m much from you about about this. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Hello? Can anyone hear me? No, I, I, I can hear you, but I was just about to get back to me. Um, honestly, like, uh, as I've posted in the chat, um, you know, I, I do agree we should be meeting people where they're at, you know, and in today's small you know, soundbite snapshot kind of world, you know, memes are an excellent source of education when it comes to um uh bringing this knowledge to the masses and before i leave um one of my good friends you know who's a uh, drug counselor um actually posted american politics has become like american sports no matter how much the team sucks regardless of how many scandals arrests and or lawsuits the players and the owners face no matter how much the tickets to the game cost, it's patrons, and regardless of how much their team's untalented pool of players make from us, fans are still out here showing their blind loyalty by screaming profanities towards the other team, and it's fans at the top of their lungs. They're proudly waving obnoxious flags to showcase their team spirit and let others know who they root for. They're attending rallies, making their favorite team their entire personality, and coming up with dumb slogans like, let's go. We all know the rest of that one. Um, to show their team support while di simultaneously dissing their team's rival. The U.S. is no longer a country. It's an am amateur sports league, and we're just we're all just the drunk fans in the stands paying fifteen dollars okay. for a cold wiener on a stale bun, sloppily waving a half filled cup of Bud Light in the air, hoping to catch a foul ball at the end of the losing game, claiming the other team cheated and hoping for a chance next year. Right. We can do better. Yes. <laughs> we can do much better. A lot, yes. I agree. I agree. Yeah. That's great. That's great. I like the way you put that. Nice to illustrate it. One percent agree. One percent. One percent. One percent agree. And that's what they do. That right there, we decided that's really what to do. That's how they. How that's how they distract and divide us. They create the illusion of freedom. They create the illusion of choice. 
they create the uh-huh. illusion that, that, that they can pick a side that um that um that that, that the Republicans are, are different to the Democrats and that the, and that the Democrats are different to the Republicans. Well, in actuality, both sides both sides hold the same <laughs> cards. There are two right. wings of the same bird. They do bird, the exact right. same thing that the other There's side two different faces. Will, will do. The There's only two difference different the only difference between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party is their methodology. That's it. <laughs> The, Repub- the, the Republicans destroy everything in their path and are blatant about where they stand on their politics and ideology, while the Democrats, the liberals, they are performative. They portray as if they are the, the friends and the allies of colonized people, of oppressed people, of marginalized people, where in actuality, they have the knife and they're in their back all the same. They silently aid in it. Yep. They sound when actually they sound they sound like aid in, the, in, in their in their oppression. That's exactly. the only difference be, between them. But other than that, they do the exact same thing. They will they, they, do they, will, exact pass, same. they will pass the policies of whichever bourgeois fuck f- funded <laughs> their, their their campaign the hardest. They will um they will let lobbyists pay pay them off to pass policies that that maximize profits. For these companies, while increasing while increasing taxes for everyone else, they will do whatever it takes that will give them the most money as fast as possible. That's they, where their allegiance they, lies. That's, that's what they lie. They that's what they do, and especially with the so-called black authoritarian left, you know, blaming you know um, the uh, the migrants, many of them who are indigenous to this land. Um, for um, taking over the so-called black community, um, you know, the city of Chicago not doing enough for us, even though they never ever have. Okay, let's let's get back to reality here, and you know, take our jobs. They are not taking your thirteen an hour job. They are not taking your twelve uh, twelve dollar fifty an hour job. They are not. Yep. They are not the native the people. Bourgeois. The native people within these borders and um, further down south of this continent of Abiyala are no more different. They are the same people with their unique cultures, with their unique histories, with their unique ways of life. They're not just one people. They are a unique mix of hundreds, hundreds of groups. These people are not illegals. They are native, period. No matter what you want to believe from these bourgeois entities that are brainwashing y'all so hard. Like, these people are so brainwashed. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's absolutely so ridiculous to me. The city of Chicago never did anything for us. Either way, look at what happened. Did y'all forget about Cabrini Green? Did y'all forget about the IDB Wells projects? Did y'all forget about forget about uh, Cookie Sandifer? Did y'all forget about him? An 11 year old? Did y'all forget about him? Did y'all forget about um, Girl X um, who was raped and left permanently disabled in the Karini Green Project? Did y'all forget about her? But no, it's the native people taking their jobs that, that are literally like giving us one paycheck away from our um, low quality housing really is, is, is their problem. It's their problem. It's always the native people's problem. This is a class struggle we're talking about. And they don't get it because it's all about their proximity to the state. The uh, found, the so-called foundational black American, the so-called American descendant of slavery. We are not Americans. We are not Italians. We are Africans. We are descendants of indigenous Africans. That is who we are, period. We are not this white entity. We are not this bourgeois entity, and they know it. But there's some brainwash that they don't even understand it. No one is taking our communities. No one is taking our 12, uh, 12 uh, 50 jobs. No one is taking our already low uh, quality ass housing, our food, our resources. They're in the same predicament as we were in the Great Migration. It's the exact same thing. 
the difference is the borders this time involved. Borders on native land. Did y'all forget about that? Or because y'all just unwound these uh, slave uh, people, you know, the so-called school system people to brainwash y'all with that bullshit. Did y'all allow them to tell y'all that that was the case? Is it the other way around this entire time? And y'all didn't even know because y'all are so brainwashed that y'all couldn't even see reality like this. But it's always their problem. It's always the lump and proletariat's problem. It's always their problem, but not the bougie people that are killing us, all of us, as we speak. It's always our problem. It's always their problem. It's always their issue, but not the U.S. Empire. Not not um not the CDC, not the FBI, not the CIA, certain certainly um not the people behind the so-called Clean Water Act, even though they're already done that out a few days ago. Really, not those people. It's always each other. It's our own problem but not the bourgeois forces. It's always our problem, but not the capitalist entities. It's always our problem, but not the global revisionists that are sucking us dry as we speak, heating up our land, throwing off our regular weather patterns through the entire years, sucking the people of Palestine dry but Israel is legitimately real, right? It's our problem, but not the bourgeois class. Think about that. Really, 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 really think about it. It's their problem, but not the same people that are oppressing you that y'all want to be close to so badly that, that made us subjugated citizens of this empire. Since supposedly we quote unquote done enough to build up this empire from the ground up, we still are. But it's our problem? No. No. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. That's where y'all yeah, said Shanti. Comrades, uh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Shanti, all power. Um, I have my all baby power. brother. I have my baby brother here with me. And he wanted to share a little something uh, uh, with y'all. And uh, let me put the camera on. Right on. How was right Lisa? On. How y'all doing? I was, We're uh, doing good. Arrested. We're good. We're good. I was recently arrested uh, on my property stating I was a trespasser. Maybe it's the color of my skin. It couldn't be in a $1 million home. Uh, trying to provide for my family and build something as a compound to for our family to to survive in the struggle. Because one day it will get back, and uh, all I'm trying to do is build a compound for my whole family and friends to to be able to go to when it's time to. Um, but approach me in a way that I, I think it was racist, uh, uh, belittle, and and really uh, against us. When approached, I was already on camera because. And they they stuck another that ever since I'm in the house for this property. Um, ever since I got closer to it, they started putting things at me. Uh, I got a warrant out for my arrest. I didn't know one day, and they arrested me, uh, stating a weapons charge and uh, and arm, uh, ammo charge. I never ever signed for that, never been arrested for that. So I don't know what they're talking about, uh, but they don't believe me. So I'll show you that. well, I missed that court date because I got arrested the other day. So now that court date's flipping, and now they're adding more stuff to my plate, and I don't know where to start or even where to finish because it's it's just like the harder I try, the more I could uh, do society and do everything they ask me to do. The sheriff's department just don't give a shit. They don't give a fuck. It's all about what they want. Uh, I didn't finish the order right, or, or I didn't file the paper correctly, or something. Always something wrong with what I'm doing, and I'm only human. I understand. That I make mistakes, but this whole getting my property was just insane. Now that I got my order, uh, they still don't grant me my uh, uh, my rights to be on my property. So I'm, I got to fight that civilly. I got to file for another uh, 
what do they call that? Uh, eviction. Eviction that there's nobody there on the property. So I don't know what's going on. And I wouldn't talk to or to tell, but I had to get off my chest because I was just released. I actually out of jail for the shit they put me in jail for. And this is not fair. This ain't right. And I don't even know if I should speak up because I, I want. But uh, let me tell me, calm down because if you, the way you may have a movement going and you might just keep battling with that. And um, uh, it's still like a day to day battle. So on Tuesday, because it's the holidays, I'm going to go down to his office, get all the paperwork I need from the assessors. So, you know, certified copies like I did, but they don't believe me. They think I uh, fraudulently made these copies. So if that's a little something for you guys right now, that's a little, that's what, that's what my mom would look like over here in California. Although it's nice and sunny outside, I still feel like I'm walking in the rainstorm. I'm so hey, sorry comrades, that happened to you, comrade. I'm so sorry that we're happened. That's give... fucking bullshit. Yeah, we're not, we're not gonna give up. They've been trying to attack us as Chicano people here and and our family and targeting our family for years already. Like we talk about the whole pipeline with some of the things that were brought up today. That's what they do. Like Comrade Chez says, I think he had his first case when he was seven years old. By the time he was fourteen, that he had got uh, some little ticket, some minimal ticket for a poly ditch or whatever small piece was. Um, and then they carries with us through a lifetime. Although you make up charges like I got. Or, yeah, or they'll create charges. Um, and then they'll say, hey, well, because of your past record. Or family's record. Or your family's record. Because you, you, what was that thing you said earlier? Um, huh? Like, so, so since you're with car, and then pay the pay for people, you know. It doesn't mean I'm gonna feel that way. I might, I might buy my car cash, you know. They don't know that though. But if they're gonna judge me, my family's you know. So we're fighting. We're here. I've been a little bit busy, um, but you know, I always very comrades. Let it long. Let us stay boots on the ground. I stay in control because when we're in, out of control, they're in control. Definitely. And that's all, comrades. Thank you for a little bit of time. Like I said, I'm so sorry that happened to you, comrade. That's fucking disgusting. <laughs> the fact the fact that they tried to fucking evict you from your own home from shit that you from shit that you never fucking did. That's fucking white supremacist racist bullshit right there. Fuck control. that shit. It's control. It's fear. That's what they're trying to do. Yeah, they're, they're trying they're to use fear. fear. Because they but want a problem. They need a problem. Justification. So justify it. Yep. Right. right. And I, I'm not giving them no room for that. I'm, 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 I'm doing everything the correct way by law. By law. You know? And, and that's what they pissed. They got pissed off yesterday when, when I was released. And, and my wife and I went down to the same sheriff's department that arrested me and showed them my documentations. Not just documentations, but certified copies stamped by the city and the county offices by the assessors. And still he didn't believe me. He thought that was, you know, something I uh, fraudulently made up through my printer. You know, until he came back after he talked to the assessor and found out it was really true. He looked at me and said, well, it's your fault that this is happening because you should have been uh, at the lockout on time. What the fuck does that got to do with anything? You know, why do I got to re- uh, ev- evict somebody from my house and there's nobody there? You know, when I already have the, the deed, the everything, this is my home. Why do I have to fight for it like that? It's not, I don't understand it. It's because they don't want Chicanos in that neck of the woods. Yeah, that's really why. But, well, we're not going to stop fighting. I'm so, not scared either. so let us all stay strong, comrades. They want to provoke you. But that's think- what they want to do. They want to provoke you. They oh, yeah. want you to mess up. They want you to say something, do right. something, so that way they can justify incarcerating you and taking away your home to further gentrification. That's what they fucking want. Right. That's what they want, exactly. That's what they're shooting so, for. And, I, and, I, and so, I'm, I'm smart enough to see that. So fuck those fascist, white supremacist fucking pigs. You're valid, man. Just know that you're valid. I appreciate that. Thank you. Right on. Right on. Um, and wish. Oh, sorry. Um, were you gonna say something? Oh, I was gonna say. Um, is there any final comments and stuff like that? Because we are supposed to go visit Mama for a a BBQ. 
I was just um I was just going to add to something that sh- oh sorry. Where you um, I was going to add to what to what, to, to what Shanti May was saying about the whole fucking American shit. You want know what's funny about that, uh, Comrade Shanti? You, you know, you know what's funny when um whenever they, they they refer to African people, they say African American. Whenever they refer to Asian people, they say Asian American. Whenever they refer to indigenous people, they say they say indigenous American. But when they but when they refer to white people, they don't say white American. They say American. You ever notice that? Yeah. Because, because under this white supremacist system, only white people are considered American, but everyone else, they're ex-American. They're ex-American. They're 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 African American, but not American. They're Asian American, but not American. They're indigenous American, but not American. That's why I've said before, and I'll say it again. America has always fucking been a settler colonial state. It is a white concept. It is created by white supremacy and the contradictions of capitalism. Nothing and, more, and nothing less. Too. And the continent too, because yep. uh, because indigenous peoples of this continent never called this land the so-called Americas. That came from an Italian, I believe, first. I believe 14, 15 years after Columbus came to Abiyagala, to uh, what is now the Bahamas, first, through the Daino. So, like, the Americas is a foreign label. It is a foreign label given to indigenous land to, you know, justify uh, the creation of the so-called new world, even though this continent was already advanced, okay? Just like Africa was, just like um, indigenous people of Oceania were, we already were developed, but we were, our places were given these European bourgeois names in order to justify the genocide of indigenous people and the stealing of their land. They have racialized indigenous people of this continent into being so-called Hispanic, into so-called Latino, into so-called Native American, as if, you know, the only Native people are those within uh, US and Canadian borders. And that's complete BS. That is complete BS because those a lot of those groups were already intermingling with each other. They were already yep. merging with each other for a very long time, for a very, very, very long time. And like the fact that they want to homogenize native people knowing how diverse and unique they are in their own ways is absolutely ridiculous to me because that's what they want. They want to homogenize people in order to make them into this one stale people. And that's not the case at all. That's immaterial, but it created the material conditions in which we are in. That's what happened. And it's still happening, especially on the border. Now that on um, the quote unquote state of Texas, which is, um, one of the puppet states of Aslan, um, you know, having more uh, border laws, you know, literally controlling indigenous land when you have about 50 different native peoples that are separated by this border. Come on. Like, come on. It's bullshit. I'm so glad you brought that out because as uh, Limpana Pache from Texas, and as a Mexica from California, um, I really hold on to my indigenous roots. Uh, and this is what goes back to studying and know who we come from and where, where we, who, who our ancestors are. And, and, and I was mentioning also the Eagle and Condor Coalition. The Eagle and Condor Coalition is for all indigenous tribes of Turtle Island, including the island comrade brothers and sisters from Hawaii, from the Tainos and all the little um, islands that the Tainos inhabited prior to the colonization. And all the way from the south of Chile, all the way up into Canada. So that's where the strength is gonna lie when we mass unite with all the peoples 
to make change. And and and, and hopefully um, you get a chance. You can check it out. Um, and and if uh, you probably learn a little something, or if there's something that's that you think that's credible for sharing, uh, feel free to share on either the Brown Beret page or that Eagle and Condor page. Yeah, yeah. Like because the Palante newspaper and like the La Raza newspaper back in the days. Nowadays, it's our uh, social media pages that evoke uh, cause, awareness, and that uh, promotes change. That's all. Yeah. Right on. Uh, this discussion was fucking awesome and amazing. Um, does anyone have? Oh, sorry. Always, it's always amazing. Like I, I love you, comrades. Like um, I think we up uplift one another in this troublesome times that we can just have enough energy to keep on pushing forward because this world will drain you if you allow it to. So whatever you do, don't watch the news. <laughs> <laughs> I'll trust me. I oh, I don't. I. I, I, don't. I, I I avoid the news. I avoid. Uh, I avoid the Western news outlets. I avoid the New York Times, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC. I avoid all of it. Okay, like because like I know what I already know what's going on. I don't need to know everything that's going on because we already know. We 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 get it already. We've been yeah, in I it. Know, like, NPR. <laughs> so NPR kind of um, is diverse and stuff. Uh, National Public Radio. And um, sometimes the BBC gets some things correct, but at the same time, I don't trust it's, everything it's, from them. But they're not going to give it the whitewashed, left wing, right wing analysis of uh, what's what what we should be thinking about, because they'll make other things that are critical thinking and they're, and, and wayward the masses and the thinking. Oh well, it's all about this. And and you were mentioning, I like the way you mentioned earlier. Uh, 14, 18, 20, or what, I mean, whatever the years are now, we're in 24, where there's going to be a new election. And as Brown Berets, we're not supportive of, uh, of, of, of either side. But at the same time, um, I guess we have to educate ourselves on that. And it all depends on where we gather our news from. Because um, obviously, you, you comrades are younger. You did not get that in the school system. It has to be self-taught um, and through reading specific books or re re uh, reviewing certain literatures and documentaries and to getting a grander scale of knowledge of what, what it really is, not what they want us to know. That's all. Right on. Um, is it okay if I read something that, that I just wrote? Sure. It's okay with y'all. Go ahead. So here's what I wrote. Martin Luther King himself said that he feared he had he led his people into a burning building. Reformism will never work under a system where the work um where um where the interests of the proletariat are, are protected are oh, sorry. Reformism will never work under a system where Oh, sorry. Reformism will never will never work under a system where the word and interest of the proletariat is um is undermined. Sorry, wait. Goddamn. I messed up here. I'm um here. I'm um, sorry. Um, I'm gonna say that again. Martin Luther King himself said that so again. Now, Martin Luther King himself said that he feared he led his people into a burning building. Reformism will never work will never work under a system where the interests of the bourgeois are protected over that of the oppressed. Regardless, regardless of who's the president, a senator, a representative, etc., it doesn't matter. They're participating in a government that upholds white supremacy, the contradiction of cap of the contra the contradictions of capitalism, imperialism, and fascism. If you try posing a threat from within the system, they'll simply kill you and replace you with, with someone who, who's a more malleable puppet. In 1953, Che went to Guatemala during the time where he had elected, when, when they had elected a new president, um, President Arbenz. 
our bands came to power democratically. He promised he wouldn't be too radical or pass radical laws. And not only did he leave the capitalists alone that were benefiting from the exploitation and oppression from the people of Guatemala, he actively protected them and was as transparent as possible. He did, he, he did quote unquote, everything right. However, our Benz wanted to pass reforms that would give some of the pr- some of the privatized land back to the indigenous people of Guatemala, while still while still compensating for for the capitalists. Yet, what did they do? They let a CIA coup on him, assassinated him, and replaced him with, with another puppet. You could do everything right, but 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 you but um um you could do everything right. But if you try to do something that even slightly goes against um, them maximizing profit, that goes against their their white supremacy, that goes against the interests of the bourgeois, you'll be killed, discarded, and replaced. Just like how the um, you cannot bring you cannot you cannot bring a ballot to a gunfight. The only way to achieve the um liberation and self-determination is through the barrel of a gun it's through revolution the whole point of being a communist is that our analysis and criticism shouldn't be based on dogmatism or or, or revisionist reactionary thoughts but on having a dialectical analysis of the internal contradictions within our society the relation between said contradictions how class struggle is currently in said society where it's at and how to apply the, the fundamentals of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism to our materialistic conditions through praxis, organizing class agita- agitation, and moving class struggle towards communism. That's what we gotta do. So right on. <clears throat> uh, I hope that I hope that um, I hope that I, I hope that made sense to you guys. <laughs> it did. It did. It did. Right on. Yes. Thank you for sharing that because that's one of the things that we're going through here. Uh, we are actually in fear for our lives and our family members' lives. On And you know what the reason why they want to take our properties is because there's mineral rights and water rights on there. Hydrocarbon. Yep. And hydrocarbon. And um, that's why they're so combative against us because uh, that they they're, they're thinking about making that almighty dollar they call it um and they're refusing to understand that hey these these properties were allocated previously from past past times and we are entitled to them and we can even move forward from that and we're going to continue moving forward because we got more properties that are entitled to us and we can move forward that's all Right on. Um, is there anything anyone wants to say before we cl- before we close and end this um, book club? No, I, I'm. I'm. We, we just got in the car and I'm heading to my mama's house for a cookout. So, comrades, it's always a pleasure for spending time with you, learning with y'all, and uplifting one another. And until until we meet again on Monday, uh, we'll. Let's all stay strong and all power to the people. All power to the people. people. Well, with that being said, I'm going to end this recording. Um, Shanti, May, if you want, you, you can stay with me on call so we can talk about s- some stuff, but I'm going to end this recording. Okay, bet. Right on. And right, peace. we'll see you. Peace. See you.